All right. Um, so it's lunchtime, so hopefully you're not too hungry and you'll manage to go through this lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about iron and we're going to talk about one of its most abundant forms in our body, which is heme. <coughs> You've heard about heme as a prosthetic group to a lot of enzymes. Um, so in the, in the second half of the lecture, we're going to talk about heme, but in the first part, we're going to talk about iron as an element and mostly how it is transported in our body and how the transport and uptake is, uh, are regulated. Uh, so that's the plan for today. Uh, hopefully we'll get through it in time. All right. Um, when we talk about iron, what, what do you know about iron itself? What, what are the uses of iron in our body? Where we can find it? Uh, what are the amounts of it in our body approximately, if you know? Okay, what, what do you know about iron? What makes it special? Okay, so there are two main oxidation states, which is ferrous, ferric, okay, so iron two, iron three. There also exists iron four, but let's leave that aside. Okay, uh, okay, good, two oxidation states, very important for the functions of iron. Okay, well that's true for hemoglobin. It's not true always, okay, but in hemoglobin, yes, heme is only capable of binding oxygen when it's in the two plus form, that is true. Do you know approximately, or have, do you have any idea how much iron we actually have in our body? Not all that much. Not all that much? Well, that depends on your point of view, I guess. So would it be in micrograms, milligrams, grams, kilograms, what do you think? Okay, micrograms, any other ideas? The total content of iron in our body? So there was a suggestion of micrograms, any other ideas or do you all agree with micrograms? Uh, grams, okay, so we have micrograms, grams. <laughs> Milligrams in the middle, all right, okay. Well, it's, <laughs> we can play that game, oh, right. Uh, it's actually in grams. We have about five grams of iron in our body. So that's why I said not that much. Well, actually, that's a substantial amount of iron. It's like a, one big nail. Usually, you know, it's described as one big nail, or something like that. So, so it's, it's a fair bit of iron. And actually, among the, uh, the trace metals or trace elements, it's one of the most abund abundant. There's actually quite a lot of iron. Um, now, most of the iron is actually in the form of heme, okay? Um, and the majority of heme is in hemoglobin, in red blood cells. So about 60% of all iron is in red blood cells, okay? So you can see that the majority of iron is actually in the form of heme, and that's why we're going to spend the, the second half of the lecture talking about heme, as it's by far the most abundant form of iron. However, we do have other forms of iron, now, do you know any proteins that contain heme, apart from hemoglobin that we just said? Myoglobin. What? Myoglobin. Myoglobin, sure. The cytochrome C, sure. Any other heme-containing proteins? Okay, there are lots of them, okay, lots of, sorry? Ferritin does not contain heme, it contains iron, but not heme, okay? Uh, but there are lots of other cytochromes, not just cytochrome C, which is in the, uh, in the respiratory chain, but there are many, many, there are probably hundreds of different cytochromes which play a lot of different roles. There are oxidases or oxygenases in various metabolic pathways, in the synthesis of cholesterol, in the degradation of, of xenobiotics, like drugs, etc. Lots of different cytochromes um, and lots of other proteins contain heme as well, which are not cytochromes. For example, complex four of the respiratory chain contains heme, it's not a cytochrome, okay, but that's another one. All right, but there also exist other forms of iron. Um, and we spoke briefly, when we talked about the respiratory chain, we spoke briefly about this weird, very ancient form of iron, which is in some of our enzymes. Does anyone remember what the name of this? Very good, iron sulfur clusters, or FES clusters. 
okay, which can be found in some of the complexes of the respiratory chain, but also, sorry? Uh, they are in complex one, yes. They're also in some of the other compl complexes. But the, this iron sulfur cluster, and for those of you who don't remember, it's this geometric arrangement of iron, usually ferric or ferrous, um, alternating with sulfur atoms in a usually a cubic shape. Okay, it's like a cube where these atoms co are bound by coordinating bonds. Very interesting and probably very, very old. It also exists in one of the enzymes of the Krebs cycle. So anyone, does anyone know which Krebs cycle enzyme contains this iron sulfur cluster? No. Hmm? Sorry? What, what's the name? It's aconitase. Aconitase contains an iron sulfur cluster and the reason why I'm reminding you of that, or maybe telling you for the first time, is that we'll use it later on in lecture. It will become important. So aconitase, a Krebs cycle enzyme, contains this iron sulfur cluster. Good. The trouble with iron is that, first of all, it's essential. There are virtually, and as far as I know, probably no living creatures that do not need iron to live. Okay, so virtually all life is dependent on iron. It's, it's, we need it, it's vital. But at the same time, it can be very dangerous because if we have too much iron, it's capable of destroying, of damaging our tissues and our cells. Does anyone know how iron does it? Why it's potentially so dangerous? Hmm? Well, it, it, it can rust, but actually most of iron that we have is not pure iron, but it's, it's ferricoferous ions, which are basically already rust, you could say. So that's not really the biggest problem, yeah? Can like, oxidation to the ferric bond be the reason To some extent it is, but I'm not sure if you're heading the same way as I'm thinking. Well, what I'll say, and you'll hear about it in another lecture later on, uh, ferrous ions are capable of catalyzing a reaction which is called the Fenton reaction, the Fenton reaction, which creates hydroxyl radical, a very, very reactive species from hydrogen peroxide. And this hydroxyl radical can damage nucleic acids, can damage uh, membranes, proteins, etc. can give rise to cancer or all sorts of things, okay? So too much iron is a problem, and we'll talk later on, well, towards the end of this half of the lecture, we'll talk about one disease where we have too much iron and what it actually looks like. So, our body has to try to get iron it needs from the envi environment, but at the same time, very tightly regulate the amount, okay? And that's why in all living forms, actually stemming back to, to bacteria, very complex or relatively complex, relatively sophisticated systems of trafficking, of moving iron around and storing it and regulating all these things have developed. And today we're going to talk about the one that exists in our cells. So we'll start with uh, the view of how iron is absorbed from the intestines. Of course, all the iron that we need, we get from the diet, okay? We can't synthesize iron, obviously, because it's an element, all right? So we need to get it from the diet. So first we'll look at the absorption of iron in the intestines. So we'll take sort of a model enterocyte. Now, iron is mostly absorbed in the duodenum, in the beginning of the small intestine, okay? So this is probably a duodenal enterocyte, but maybe some of the, later, uh, some of the ones later on in the small intestine can also play this role. So, for iron, uh, we basically have a transporter, we have a, a pump, which is capable of transporting, of taking iron 2 plus and importing it into the cell. This transporter is called DMT1, which stands for divalent metal transporter. Okay, so it's in the name, it can transport only divalent ions, and iron 2 is one of them. The trouble is that in the majority of situations, iron in nature and also in our gut does not really exist, or 
does not exist pre predominantly in the iron two form. Most of iron two, if we just expose it to air or to whatever, will oxidize spontaneously to iron three. And iron three is a pretty, uh, is a species which is very difficult to work with because it's very poorly soluble in water. Okay, so once iron two oxidizes, it kind of drops out of the solution. It forms this precipitate of, of ferric hydroxide or something like that, and uh, and we can't use it anymore. So our body has to have ways of reducing iron three, which is what we eat iron as usually. Okay, so we need to be able to reduce it to iron two, and there are two ways of doing it. One is non-enzymatic, which does not need an enzyme. And that is basically just based on what we eat, what, on the composition of the diet. So if the diet contains reducing agents, okay, so if in the diet there are reducing agents present, these can increase the reduction of iron three to iron two, and through this way, they can increase the absorption of iron from the diet. Do you have any suggestions of what kind of reducing agents might be present in, the, in our diet. Indeed, vitamin C is one of the most important and most potent reducing agents that we can find in the diet. And indeed, taking vitamin C or taking foods that contain vitamin C together with iron or even without iron will increase the ability of our body to, uh, to absorb iron. Okay? And there are also other types of reducing agents, but vitamin C is the one that would be probably good to remember, because indeed, if you have patients who are uh, iron deficient, giving them vitamin C together with iron supplements can actually increase the, um, uh, the absorption of iron and therefore improve their condition. All right? But as I said, there are also other reducing agents. Now, that's the non-enzymatic pathway. But in recent years, an enzyme, another membrane found enzyme was discovered, which probably, it's still not 100% sure, but it looks like that that's, that's what the role of the enzyme is, can take iron three, sorry, iron three plus, and reduce it to iron two plus. Now, the name of the enzyme, again, it's a membrane, it's a membrane enzyme. The name of the enzyme is not as nice as DMT1, perhaps. It's called d sit B, which stands for duodenal cytochrome B, okay, another cytochrome, okay, duodenal cytochrome B. And this enzyme sits on the membrane, looks out for iron 3, and reduces it using electrons from the cell, you, uh, reduces it uh, to iron 2, which then can be absorbed. All right? Now, once the iron two gets into the enterocyte, there are several different things that can happen to it, okay? Of course, it can be used just to make stuff for the enterocyte, okay? To make heme or to make cytochromes or whatever, okay? All sorts of things. The other possibility is that it can be stored. What is the storage form? You've heard of that. What is the storage form of iron? Ferritin, ferritin indeed, ferritin. Ferritin is a, uh, it's hard to say whether it's actually a protein because the, the way it looks when, when, you, when you see it in a cell is that it's a huge spherical crystal of ferric hydroxide, so it's crystalline ferric hydroxide with a, just a thin envelope of protein. And the protein is there to channel the iron into the crystal and just the crystal just keeps kind of growing. Okay, so that's what ferritin particles look like. They're very interesting, they're magnetic, they're quite, quite an interesting thing. In recent years, the idea that ferritin is primarily a storage form of iron has been challenged. And now people think more of ferritin as a detoxification of excess iron. Okay, so it's less so a storage in which we can put iron and take it away whenever we, we want and more of a method to safely kind of store all the, the iron that we don't need away. The reason for this, for this change in thinking is that getting iron from ferritin is very hard. You can't just come and say, ferritin, give me some iron, we'll use it for something else. You actually have to put the iron into a lysosome 
destroy it completely, and even then you only get part of all the iron that is stored there. Okay? So getting iron from ferritin is hard, so it's probably better to think of ferritin as like, you know, storing the excess iron, we'll, we'll never need it, let's put it into, into ferritin. And the reason for that is, as I said before, if we have too much iron, it becomes very toxic, it becomes a big problem. So that's why it's important to have ferritin to put it away. Okay? And indeed, the final possibility for the iron in our model duodenal enterocyte is to export it into the blood, okay? to send it into the blood. This is the idea of absorb absorbing iron, because all the iron that remains in the enterocyte is not useful for the body. Um, do you know the usual, half, the usual lifetime of, a, of an enterocyte? Do you know how long it lives? Sorry? Sorry, I, I just couldn't hear that. Okay, it's about three days. Okay, the usual, uh, the usual time is given as three days. Um, so there's a, it's a very high turnover cell. So basically all the iron that's inside it gets excreted after three days. Okay, it's gone. Okay, so only the iron that is exported into the blood is the one that is useful for us in any way. And again, this will become important once we talk about the regulation of, of absorption. On the abluminal membrane, on the basolateral membrane, we have another transporter for iron, but this time it's not called DMT1, it's a different uh, transporter which is called ferroportin. Ferroportin. Okay, and ferroportin takes iron and excretes it into the blood. Now, once again, any kind of free iron is dangerous, so our body always tries to bind it to something, okay? Always try to, tries to bind it into a protein or hide it away somehow so that it's not active in this weird Fenton, Fenton reaction. And the main transport form of iron in the blood is a protein called transferrin. Very good. So transferrin is a protein which can bind two ions, two ferric ions. I'm just going to draw two ferric ions, which can bind to it. It can also have just one or zero, okay? So it's not like all transferrin is fully saturated by iron, okay? It's not. And actually later on in internal medicine, uh, you learn about using transferrin saturation as a method for detecting how much iron we have, we have in our body, okay? So it's not so much about the amount of transferrin, but how saturated with iron it is but let's leave that aside. So transferrin can bind at most two uh, ions of ferric iron. However, as you can see, we exported ferrous iron. So we also have to, w have to have a way, now we are in the blood, we have to have a way to once again oxidize it back to iron three so that transferrin can bind it. Now, for a long time, it was thought that transferrin can do the oxidation itself. And in fact, in vitro, if we do it in a test tube, that is true. So transferrin wants to bind iron so hard that it's capable, in the presence of iron two, that it's capable to, to, to force it to oxidize to iron three. Okay, so it's, uh, for a long time it was thought that no, no enzymes are, um, are needed for that. However, again, a few years ago, a protein and a, a ferrous oxidase was discovered, which most likely oxidizes this iron two, which has been output by ferroportin um, into, into uh, iron three so that it can be bound to, um, to transferrin. The name of this oxidase is hephestin. Hephestin, and the name of this protein, probably for those of you who know some Greek myths, actually rings to, to Hephaestus, who was, why is it connected to iron? Yes, he was the blacksmith of the gods. So Hephaestin, this oxidase, uh, is called after Hephaestus. Rip 
oh, well, the story about the Greek god, if you don't know it, don't worry about it. That's not important, okay? The important thing is that this enzyme takes iron 2, which has been exported, oxidizes it to iron 3, so the transferrin can bind it, all right? That's the important bit. All right, and that's the whole story of absorption of iron in the gut. However, as I said, it's very, very important for our body to tightly regulate how much iron it is getting from the gut. Because if it's too little, we can't do the stuff that we need to do, like, like make red blood cells. And if it's too much, we, become, uh, we, we, uh, we get iron overload, which can, be, which can be a difficult thing. The regulation of iron absorption from the gut is by a hormone. So there's a hormone called hepcidin. And this hormone is excreted from the liver. So the liver here acts as, a, um, as an endocrine gland, basically. And as you most likely know, liver is also an exocrine gland because it produces bile, okay? But it's also an endocrine gland. And this is one of the, the hormones that the liver secretes, okay? Hepcidin. Um, hepcidin is, is released when the liver thinks that there is enough iron, okay? And I won't go into the method by which the liver knows that, okay? It's relatively complicated, okay? So I'll leave that aside. But when the liver thinks that there's enough iron, it starts secreting hepcidin. And hepcidin goes through the blood into the duodenum, into the small intestine, and binds to ferroportin from the outside, okay? It binds to ferroportin. And as soon as it binds to ferroportin, ferroportin is endocytosed into the cell and destroyed. Okay? So once again, when the liver thinks there's enough iron, it starts secreting hepcidin, hepcidin binds to ferroportin, and ferroportin is destroyed. The rest of the absorption machinery is not really in affected in any way, okay? So it still keeps pumping iron into the enterocyte. But as we said, if this iron is not exp uh, exported into the blood, after three days, the enterocyte goes away and takes all the iron that has been packed into it with it. So no iron is really uh, absorbed, and therefore the, the balance of iron, or the right amount of iron is, is assured. Now with hepcidin, and I said that there is a condition, or there are actually several conditions where we have iron overload. So one of these conditions, which is hereditary, or can be hereditary, is called hemochromatosis, and it's connected to hepcidin. So hemochromatosis generally is a disease of iron overload, of too much iron. But the typical example of hemochromatosis is hereditary, inherited, hemochromatosis, which is, called by, which is caused by a mutation in a gene called HFE. Not all of them are, but the majority are. And HFE is a gene which is crucial, or the, the product of the gene, is crucial in the regulation of hepcidin secretion. So when there's mutation in HFE, the liver doesn't know that there's already enough iron does not excrete enough hepcidin, and more and more iron is taken up uh, by, the, uh, by the gut, and the people suffer from, um, from iron overload. By the way, the, the, the name of the gene HFE, or the gene product, just stands for high FE, high iron, okay? Yeah. Not a very imaginative name, like hephestin or something, all right? Um, the, the typical... Uh, the symptoms of hemochromatosis, which develops for a very long time, okay, so it's, it's inherited, but actually takes a long time to develop, is a dark pigmentation, kind of bronze pigmentation of the skin, okay? It's not a typical pigmentation like, you know, like if you go to uh, and sunbathe or something, it's kind of bronze color, okay? Um, and oftentimes these patients have diabetes, have type 1 diabetes. And the reason for both of them is that this too much iron starts affecting various tissues differently, okay? So the overload of iron in the skin changes the, the color of the skin, and the too much iron in beta cells of the pancreas kills them off, 
and that causes diabetes. So in older textbooks, hemochromatosis is also called bronze diabetes. Okay, so they have bronze color and they have diabetes. Um, it's quite interesting that now there is literature which suggests there's a hypothesis that these mutations in the AHFG, HFE gene were part of the ad adaptation of humans as they went from the warm climates in Africa and, and South Asia as they moved towards the north. So there's a hypothesis that basically they needed more iron to keep themselves warm or to survive. And that's why we have these mutations. And, and it's still true that the majority of these mutations are, uh, have people from like North European descent, of North European descent, so in Scandinavia, uh, and there, there's a higher, pro higher proportion of people who have these mutations. So that's why we have this hypothesis. But um, I don't think it's been completely proven, but it makes sense in some ways. Um, so when we have too much iron, Okay, in the body, some cells are very sensitive to the damage caused by this reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. And beta cells in the pancreas are very, very sensitive to that. So basically, when there's too much iron, they get killed off, no more insulin, and that's why we have type 1 diabetes in these patients. All right. So that's the absorption and regulation of our, at the level of the organism. Now let's have a look at a normal cell in the body, because of course each cell has to produce its own heme and, and its own cytochromes, etc., etc. So it needs to get the iron that it needs. But the, the, the mechanisms there are a bit different, and also the regulations are a bit different. So this is just some generic cell in the body. Okay, we're no longer in the gut. Okay, just generic some kind of cell. Now our cells it is assumed that the only way our cells can get iron is from transferrin. So there might be some other ways, but I'll, I'm not going to talk about those because they are probably not very important. So each cell expresses transferrin receptors, or TF, TFRs, transferrin receptors which have a very, very high affinity for saturated, for saturated uh, transferrin. So they don't have a very high affinity for unsaturated, for sa transferrin that doesn't have any iron, but very high affinity for transferrin with iron, which makes sense because what would be the point of trying to get iron from transferrin which doesn't contain any iron? So when transferrin binds, saturated transferrin binds to transferrin receptor, the whole receptor transferrin complex gets endocytosed. And we have an endocytic vesicle which contains the receptor and transferrin, saturated transferrin there. Now, I told you before that the affinity of transferrin to iron is extremely high. Okay, it's very, very high. It really, really, really wants to bind iron. So if we want to get the iron out of it, if we want to release it, we have to change something. We have to do some kind of a trick. And the trick here is to change the pH. Because the affinity of transferrin to iron decreases very quickly with decreasing pH. So what happens here is that we start pumping protons into the vesicle using proton pumps. Okay, so we start pumping protons. The pH goes down, and as the pH goes down, this iron is released. Okay, the receptor transferring complex is still intact, okay? But the iron is released, and once it's released, we have once again DMT1, which allows the iron to go into the, into the cell, where it can be used for whatever. Once again, we need to change the iron 3 into iron 2, because DMT1 only accepts divalent metals. Just one second. Um, so we need to have probably something that reduces it. Now, it is not very clear what reduces iron in, this, in these vesicles. It looks like it could be a, pro a protein called 
with an abbreviation STEP, but it's still a candidate. It's still a candidate reductase. It's not clear whether that's it. There was a question? Yeah, okay. After this happens, to iron two. So this reduces iron three. Yes, most likely. I mean, it has to be reduced in the vesicle and it's most likely done by this protein, okay? But as I said, it's still a candidate for, it's not 100% sure. Now, after this happens and iron is released, the receptor, the transferring receptor transferring complex is then recycled back onto the membrane Okay, so this is not destroyed. The receptor and the transferrin are not destroyed. They are recycled back, they are exocytosed back into the membrane. And since I said that the affinity of the transferrin receptor is only to the fully loaded transferrin, now the affinity of the empty transferrin is very low, so the transferrin goes back into the blood and can pick up iron somewhere else and then bring it back to the, um, to the cell. Yes, the receptor stays on the membrane. It's a transmembrane receptor. Okay? Now, how is it regulated at the level of the individual cell? Hepcidin doesn't play a role here, okay? It's no longer regulated hormonally, obviously, because each cell will have different need for, uh, for, for iron. So basically, the main level of uh, regulation is at the, at the number of transferring receptors. So if a cell knows that it doesn't have enough iron, it puts up more transferring receptors so that it can get more transferring. If the cell knows that it has too much iron or enough iron, it gets rid gradually of the transferring receptors and no more iron is or fewer, or fewer iron uh, atoms are being absorbed. Now, how does the cell know that it has enough iron. And this I will go in some detail, how this works, okay? And this is true for all, uh, all cells in our body. Our cells contain proteins in the cytoplasm, contain proteins called IRPs, which act as sensors of iron. Now, there are at least two types, maybe more types of IRPs, so I'll be only talking about IRP1, which is the easier one. Okay. We'll have a break in about three minutes. So just try to get your last bits of energy. Okay, and then we'll take a break. IRP1 is actually a, is a protein which is very similar to aconitase. And that's why I mentioned it in the beginning. So aconitase, the enzyme of the Krebs cycle, which is in the mitochondrion, which is in the mitochondrial matrix, is very similar to IRP1. That's why IRP1 is sometimes called cytoplasmic aconitase, because it has actually aconitase activity. But there is no Krebs cycle in the, in the cytoplasm, so it doesn't actually do these things, okay? But it's there and it's very similar. Now, IRP1, similar to aconitase, contains an iron sulfur cluster. And in this iron sulfur cluster, one of the iron atoms is relatively labile. It's not very stably bound. It's not very strongly bound. So it can be released or it can come back. Now the probability that it's released from the cluster or that it comes back depends on the concentration of iron in the cytoplasm. So if the concentration of iron in the cytoplasm is high, the cluster will be complete. If the concentration of iron in the cytoplasm is low, one of the atoms will go out Okay, just based on equilibria. And the, the whole cluster is destroyed, is open. And as the cluster is opened, the whole protein changes its conformation and assumes this open conformation. Okay, so RP1, when there is enough iron, it's closed. And when there is not enough iron, it becomes open. This open form of IRP1, of this iron sensor, can bind to messenger RNAs. And this is the principle of regulation of all these proteins that are involved in this, because the IRP1, when it's activated, can bind to, to uh, messenger RNA, 
and can influence the translation of the genes for these proteins. And I know that you've not done a huge amount on translation and regulation of translation, but you know the basic bits, okay? So we have messenger RNA, which is produced in the, in the nucleus, then it goes to the ribosome, and there it is translated into a protein, right? And messenger RNAs have a five prime end and a three prime end, okay? And they have five prime untranslated regions and three prime untranslated regions. This is this something you've seen before? Yeah? Okay, and in between is the actual gene which is being translated into, into the protein, all right? Now some genes for some proteins, and I'll tell you which ones in a second, have in their mRNA sequence sequences that form these hairpin loops, these strange loops, okay? And that's because these sequences can pair up and form these loops, okay? And these special regulatory sequences are called IREs, or iron response element. Okay, iron response element just means a sequence of mRNA or sequence of a gene which responds, which allows it to respond to iron levels, okay? And many different genes have these sequences, yes? It's IRP, iron response protein? It's iron response element binding protein. But yes, okay, these two are connected, okay? So it's IRE binding protein, okay? In older, in older literature, you'll find that. So you'll find it as IREBP, but then it was shortened to just IRP, right? Okay, so now, now this is important to, for you to understand, and I know it's a little bit harder because you've not done a lot of translation, transcription, stuff like that, but now it's important. So. IRP, when it opens, can bind to these loops, okay? It binds specifically to these loops, like so. What will happen to the translation of this mRNA when the hairpin loops are occupied with IRP? it will go down. There won't be any translation, right? Because the ribosome cannot start the translation because the way is blocked by these massive proteins hanging off the, uh, the mRNA, okay? So the IREs, when we find them in the five prime region, in the five prime untranslated region, those are gonna be in genes where when there is not enough iron, okay, IRP is open, not enough iron, IRP is open, we want their translation to go down. We don't need them. Out of these proteins, which ones would you say are the most likely to have IREs in the five prime region? So something that when there's not enough iron, we don't need. No. If there's not enough iron, we'll need a lot of transferrin receptor. So it's the other way around. But for example, we don't need ferritin. Because we, know, we don't have enough iron, so what, what would be the point of making ferritin, which as we said is you know, to put away excess iron, okay? So for example, ferritin ha does have indeed IREs in the five prime region, and when there's not enough iron, it will not become, it will not get translated. The same way we have genes that don't have five prime UTRIREs, but actually three prime. And they work the same way. But now what happens when they are occupied with a protein? And this may be something you might not know, but does anyone have any idea what happens when we Occupy the the three prime uh, the three three prime untranslated region. The same segment gets repeated, like, uh, Pretty much, the translation of the mRNA actually goes up. The reason is not so much that it gets repeated, so that the ribosome just comes to the end and starts from the start, because that will happen to any mRNA. The reason here is that mRNAs, when they are produced in the nucleus, 
they are gradually degraded. So there are enzymes, there are nucleases that gradually degrade the mRNAs because otherwise the cell just will be full of mRNAs. So we have to get rid of them. And the degradation starts from the three prime region. Okay? So they're kind of being cut away gradually from the three prime region until they're completely destroyed. Now, if the three prime uh, UTR is, is occupied by IRP, the destruction will slow down or will stop and therefore the mRNA can be translated again and again and again and again and we get a lot of the protein. Okay? So the, the three prime IREs are, for example, in transferrin receptor gene because when we don't have enough iron, we want to make as much of the transferrin receptor as we can so that we get enough iron in. Okay. Any questions? So let's take a three minute break and we still have, you have a question. That's a protein, a candidate protein for the reduction of iron-3, which is released here in the vesicle, into iron-2 so that it can be transported into the cell. It's still not 100% sure, but it's the most likely candidate. Okay. So when it's to the, the end, we're going to have a lot of receptors from... Correct, yeah. So different genes for different proteins will have IREs either here or here, and depending then on the, the amount of iron, they will either get translated a lot or not a lot. Okay? All right, let's take a three minute break. We still have quite a lot to go through, so let's keep it to three minutes, okay? And then we'll start with heme synthesis, which I think is easier in many ways. Any more questions about iron trafficking? The, the stuff with the IRP, IREs probably needs a little bit of thinking about it. When this goes up, what happens, okay? So you might need to spend a you know, couple minutes just thinking about it. So don't worry if, if you don't, didn't quite get it, but hopefully it should be quite logical. All right, so now I want to talk about how we make heme. And as I said, the majority of iron in our body exists as heme, actually in hemoglobin, the majority of that. Um, so heme is a very, very important form of iron which keeps the iron both soluble, so it's available for reactions, but it also keeps it relatively unreactive, so it will not catalyze these weird, horrible reactions that will destroy the cells, okay? So it's a very useful uh, way of keeping iron useful, but not dangerous. Now, uh, heme, as you know, has a relatively complicated structure but in fact, if we, bake, if we actually break it down, you'll see that it's relatively simple because it's composed of four building blocks. Uh, and these building blocks are just put together. And that's why the whole synthesis of heme, which again may look very complicated, you'll see that in the first two steps, we put together the building blocks and then we just put them all together as a Lego thing. Okay, so it's, it's not super hard synthesis. The hard thing, are the names. The names of the intermediates are very, very strange, okay? Because for historical reasons, they were discovered in different contexts and they have strange names. But the logic of the synthesis should not be very difficult. All right, so what are the building blocks? What are the four bits that form heme? Hmm? Pyral, okay. So not links, but rings. maybe, oh, rings, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Rings, they are indeed. All right, so we have pyrrole for pyrroles, like so. And they're connected by one carbon bridges, okay? So we have four pyrroles, four pyrrole rings, and connected by one carbon bridges. This, and it's kind of logical, this makes heme into a tetrapyrrol. Tetrapyrrol. Now, we have other kinds of tetrapyrroles, okay? So heme is just a special kind of tetrapyrrol, but we, as we'll see, there are other types of tetrapyrroles. Heme is a cyclical tetrapyrrol, okay? It's the, the, the four pyrroles are connected into a ring but we also have linear tetrapyrroles, okay? And we'll see a few of them in a second, okay? So we have linear tetrapyrroles, cyclical tetrapyrroles. Now, 
Heme is actually an even more special type of tetrapyrrole because in addition to being cyclical, it's also unsaturated. And it's unsaturated in a very special way and that is, and that way makes it aromatic. Okay, so the same way benzene ring is aromatic, the whole ring of heme is also aromatic. I'll just put in the, uh, the double bonds. Don't worry, you won't be asked to draw this, so. Like so. So, if you spend a bit of time looking at it, you'll see that the double bonds are actually conjugated, and they do follow the Hickel's rule, which describes which rings are going to be aromatic. So, this whole ring, which is called porphyrin, porphyrin ring, I'll, I'll explain it once again, what the relationship is between the terms, is an aromatic ring. So it's aromatic and it's very large. So what does it mean? What do, what do aromatic compounds have usually having, what kind of properties do they have? Hmm? Yes. It's not a general property of aromatic compounds because benzene, well, I mean, benzene does absorb light, but in the UV region, so we can't see it. But as the ring becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, the energy of the photons, which can be absorbed, comes down. And indeed, this porphyrin ring is, is colored. It is a purple, dark red color, okay? Even without the iron, it's already colored, okay? So, so yes, color is, is one of them. Any other properties of aromatic rings? Insoluble, well, hmm. Okay, so it's relatively stable, so it's chemically stable, okay? It's not easy to do reactions to it, and it's flat, okay? It's flat, okay? It's not twisted, but it's actually flat. All right, so once again, the terminology. This is a tetrapyrrole because there are four pyrroles there. It's a cyclical tetrapyrrole because they are connected into a ring. And this is a porphyrin because it's unsaturated, okay? So porphyrin is a saturated aromatic tetrapyrrole. Cyclical, of course, because otherwise it won't work, All right? It's so just the, the terminology. Now, in order to make out of this porphyrin, you look very unhappy. Oh, sorry, unsaturated, of course, okay? Unsaturated, okay? Uh, in order to make out of this porphyrin, to make heme, we need to add some things. Well, first of all, there are some substituents here on the rings, and we'll see in a second what they are. So don't worry about them too much. Some stuff hanging of it. And of course, we also need the iron to go in, which is bound to the nitrogens of the, the pyro rings. There, of course, exist in nature other porphyrins, and you probably know at least one of them, apart from him. Chlorophyll. chlorophyll, indeed. Chlorophyll is also a porphyrin, okay? Very similar ring with slightly different substituents, but instead of iron in chlorophyll, we find magnesium. magnesium. Very good, all right? Okay, so, but otherwise, the, the two substances are very, very close to each other. Now, just one caveat. There is another group of compounds which look very similar to porphyrins, but in, but in fact they are not porphyrins. And one of them is vitamin B12. Vitam when you look at the structure of vitamin B12, it will look very similar to this. Of course, it contains cobalt inside it, but otherwise it will look very similar. However, vitamin B12 is not a porphyrin because it actually lacks one of these bridges. There is a direct connection between two rings. So it's really just one atom is missing, but that makes it into a completely different ring. The ring is called corin and not porphyrin, and it can be only synthesized by bacteria. None of the higher plants or animals can synthesize vitamin B12 or the corin ring, okay? So this tiny little detail, when one of these bridges are missing and, and, and are directly connected, makes it into a completely different compound, which we can't synthesize, just, just so you know, okay? So vitamin, vitamin B12 is not a porphyrin. All right, how do we make it? How do we synthesize it? The synthesis of heme 
starts in the mitochondrion, then it goes out into the cytoplasm, and it comes back in the end back to the mitochondrion. Okay, so it's a weird synthesis which starts and ends in the mitochondrion, but the majority actually occurs in the cytoplasm. Okay? So, the, building, the basic building blocks for making heme are relatively simple. One is glycine, and the other one is succinyl-CoA. Succinyl coenzyme A. So glycine is an amino acid, all right? You've heard of how we can synthesize it. Any ideas how we can make glycine? There are a couple ways. We can make it from serine, very good. And there's Certainly not, no. There is another synthesis which also occurs in mitochondria where we, took, where we take ammonia, carbon dioxide, and methylene tetrahydrofolate and we just kind of put them together. Okay, it's a very interesting synthesis where from basically inorganic things we make an amino acid, it's pretty cool. All right, nevertheless, that's not, that's not what we're talking about now. now these two compounds are then connected together. Of course, the, um, uh, the uh, coenzyme A is released. Uh, where is succinyl-CoA coming from? The Krebs cycle, indeed. That's why it's occurring in the, in the matrix. So these two things are put together, and what we make out of it is a compound looking like this. So we take away carbon dioxide and of course coenzyme A. You should know, well, these two you of course already know and, and this one you should know. The rest of the structures you won't need to know, no. This one you should, you should be able to draw, okay? The rest of them, you should recognize what they are, but you won't be asked to draw them. So this compound is the first committed step of the synthesis, okay? So from this, from this step on, we're making porphyrins, okay? But it's basically, or, or at least tetrapyrols. There's no other way, okay? So this is the first committed step. Uh, this compound is called uh, delta amino levulinic acid. As I said, the names are horrible and they will get much worse than this, okay? Uh, so delta or 5-amino-levulinic five, five acid, okay? 5-amino-levulinic acid. Weird name, but that's how it is. All right, so this reaction takes place in the mitochondrion and the enzyme is called ALA synthase or delta amino levulinic acid synthase, okay? It's better to use ala synthase, probably. Ala synthase uh, contains a typical cofactor which is used with amino acids because here is basically an amino acid decarboxylation, so what would the cofactor be? Pyridoxal phosphate, very good. Contains pyridoxal phosphate. Since this reaction is the first committed step in the synthesis, it's also, as is usually the case, as is usually the case, the, the main regulatory step of the whole pathway. So ala synthase is the main regulatory step. There are other ones as well, but this is the main one. Uh, in most cells, apart from the cells that give rise to red blood cells, so these are apart, in normal cells, we have ala synthase one a subtype, okay? So the majority of all the, well, the majority of cells uh, have allosynthase one. And allosynthase one is mainly regulated negatively 
by him. Okay, so if there's enough heme, allosynthase will be inhibited and the cells won't make any more heme. Kind of logical, okay? Typical feedback inhibition, nothing special about it. Um, mostly heme, but also the oxidized form of heme, so hemine, okay? Uh, the rest of the porphyrins are a bit tricky, okay? Some of the porphyrins do not actually inhibit it. Okay, but I don't want to go into too much detail, but let's have heme, okay? Uh, yeah. Because heme actually, hemine is used to treat some diseases with this problem, so we can actually give an infusion of hemine, but let's not worry about it now. In erythroid cells, in cells that give rise to red blood cells, this kind of regulation would not work. Why? Because in red blood cell, we want to pack as much heme, as much hemoglobin as we can, as we can all right? So if there was a feedback inhibition, we wouldn't be able to make a red blood cell. So in erythroid cells, we have allosynthase 2, which is not feedback inhibited by heme, which is in fact mainly regulated by the availability of iron which again is logical. If we're making red blood cell, we're synthesizing heme to make, to make hemoglobin. If there's not enough iron, there's no point of doing that. We'll spend a lot of energy and a lot of effort into making a porphyrin, but we won't have the iron to put in, okay? So the logic behind it is, is, is quite clear. So does it have like iron? Indeed, okay? So allosynthase 2, the gene or the mRNA, also contains IREs and the regulation is the same as we, as we talked about before, okay? And as your homework, you can work out whether the IREs are gonna be on the five prime region or the three prime region, okay? It's logical, all right? So allosynthase is regulated by iron availability, not by him. Good. So the first step occurs in the mitochondrial matrix and after this, the product, the delta amino levulinic acid, is exported from the mitochondrion. Okay, so we are out of the mitochondrion into the, the cytoplasm. What happens there is, and here is my promise that in two steps we make the Lego brick that will basically form the whole heme. So in the second step, we take two molecules of ALA and we join them together. Okay, but we don't join them together symmetrically, but slightly asymmetrically. I'll try to draw that. Hopefully it will make sense. So we have two molecules of ALA, like so. two almost exactly identical molecules, all right? And now we join them together by removing two molecules of water. And one molecule of water will be removed here, this oxygen and these hydrogens. And the other molecule of water will be removed here, okay? This oxygen and these hydrogens, okay? So two molecules water go away and as you can see by doing this we actually created a five membered ring containing nitrogen which is the pyrrole ring so the product of this is again as I promised is the first, is the building block from which we'll make the whole, the whole heme molecule. And it's this. Can you see how we got from this to here? Okay, this is this thing hanging off here. 
here we have these two weird substituents, and then we have the five-membered ring, and two molecules of water go away. Okay? Yeah? Good. The product, unfortunately, has another horrible name. It's called porphobilinogen. Porphobilinogen. Okay? The logic behind the name is, is kind of clear, okay? Porphobilinogen, so it's a compound that gives rise to porphyrins and also bile pigments. Porphobilinogen, okay? But as I said, yeah. And th the names of the intermediates don't even connect to each other, okay? Because the next one, as you'll see, is completely different, okay? Unfortunately. But the logic, hopefully, is relatively simple. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called ala dehydratase, or dehydratase of delta amino levulinic acid, so ala D, dehydratase, okay, don't confuse it with dehydrogenase, it's not a dehydrogenase, it's a dehydratase, okay, water is removed, yes? That's also a possibility, a possible name. There are synonyms. So ala dehydratase and porphobilinogen synthase are synonyms, okay? Now, ala dehydratase or porphobilinogen synthase uh, contains zinc in its active site. So it's a metal enzyme, it contains zinc. First of all, that's important because when we talk about trace metals, okay, and we ask you, well, name an enzyme that contains copper, zinc, whatever, zinc, okay, here is ala dehydratase, so you can remember that. The other reason why I mention that is that in certain kinds of heavy metal poisoning, which I, by which I don't mean poisoning by the music, uh, but actual heavy metals, like lead, for example, So lead ions are relatively similar to zinc ions and they will go into ala dehydratase and also some other enzymes and will inhibit them, okay? So they exchange for zinc and they inhibit the enzyme. So when we have lead poisoning, what we find is that first of all, the level of heme synthesis goes down. So people with lead poisoning, with chronic lead poisoning will have anemia. They won't have enough hemoglobin synthesized. But they will also have a lot of ala in their urine, because it's going to be accumulating as the, uh, the heme synthesis is not, is not working. Okay, so plenty of ALA, not enough heme in lead poisoning. All right, what, happen what happens next? From now on, you could probably figure it out what needs to be done, okay? We take four porphobilinogen molecules and we just put them one next to each other. Sorry, we're still in cytosol. I'll, I'll say when we go back to, into, into the mitochondria. Okay, still in cytosol. So we take four porphobilinogens and just stick them next to each other. Yeah? When did we leave the cytosol? Or when did we leave the mitochondria? Here. Okay, after the first step. So, and I'm just, I'm now going to draw it just schematically. Okay, so it's, I'm going to be simplifying and simplifying the, the, for, the, the structures, but hopefully you know because otherwise I would spend a lot of time drawing. So what we have now, after we put four porphobilinogens together, we get a substance which looks like this. Do you understand what I just drew there? Those are the rings with the substituents, okay, just connected by one carbon links. Some of you look very, yeah? Yeah, that's this, but only instead of amino group, there is an OH group there. I'll explain in a second, okay? This compound is our first tetrapyrrole, okay? It's a linear tetrapyrrole, and it's called hydroxymethyl bilane. Strange. 
thing. The hydroxymethyl bit is clear because that's this little thing hanging of it, okay? The rest of it is just the way it is. The enzyme is called porphobilinogen deaminase. And that's hopefully the answer to your question, why is there the OH? Because it's a deaminase and it gradually chops off the amino groups of the, all the four molecules. Only the three of them are connected to each other and this one just remains as an OH group. Okay, so it's PBG deaminase. Now, here we, coming, here we are coming to one of the most interesting reactions in our metabolism. But in order for you to understand what happens there, we need to go a little bit back to porphobilinogen. Because when I drew, when I drew the, uh, the structure of heme, I said that there are some substituents hanging of it, okay, of the rings. Well, here are the substituents, and we need to understand what they are before we can continue with the, with the synthesis. So, this substituent is usually in literature called acetyl. Sorry. Acetyl. And this, with using the same logic, is called propionyl. So, A and P. Now, in fact, for those of you who have a very keen eye on uh, organic nomenclature, you'll know that acetyl and propionyl are actually the incorrect names of these substituents. Because acetyl would have to be the other way around. It would have to be CH3CO, and propionyl would have to be CH3CH2CO, okay? So these are actually incorrect names. However, they are used everywhere in literature, so we're gonna use them as well. But the correct names would be carboxymethyl and carboxyethyl are the correct names, all right? But we're gonna use A and P, standing for acetyl and propionyl, but not really. All right, so when we look at our hydroxymethyl bilane molecule, what we see there is alternating AP AP, AP, AP. Okay, nothing interesting about that. Do you all understand what these APs are? Good. So in the next step, from our linear tetrapyrrole, we make the first cyclical tetrapyrrole. So we actually connect them into a ring. And now I will need you to pay attention because if you miss here, you might get confused about what actually happens. So imagine that we just took this hydroxymethyl bilane and connected it as it is into a ring, okay? What we would get, don't, don't draw this. What we would get, because that's not what happens, okay? What we would get is, sorry, a ring a cyclical tetrapyrrole, which would have AP, 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 right? We just remove basically this OH groups and we connect it, all right? The name of this stuff that I just drew is uroporphyrinogen 1. Don't write it down, don't write it down. Europorphyrinogen 1. This is not what we want. It will actually spontaneously occur if one of the next enzymes are damaged. So if the rest of the pathway is not working, or actually even if this enzyme is, is damaged, some of the hydroxymethylbiline will spontaneously form this cycle, but this is the wrong one. We don't want this one. What we actually want is uroporphyrinogen 3, which is an isomer of, of uroporphyrinogen 1, but the crucial difference, and if I can have your attention again, the crucial difference is that one of the rings 
is turned around. Indeed, so it will be not APAPAP, but it will be APAPAPPA. Now, to you, it will look like, well, well what's the point? Why? Why? Why not have the, the symmetrical, nice one? I don't know. That's how evolution made it, okay? That's why we have it. And actually, all the animals or, or plants that synthesize heme or whatever have this kind of ring, okay? So that's the way it is, okay? Maybe it was some kind of an accident. Maybe there are some good reasons for that. I, I don't know. So this is europorphinogen 3. And the enzyme, as you would expect, well, probably, is called europorphinogen 3 synthase. Sorry. Okay, I'm using just this abbreviation, Europgen, Europorphinogen, so that I have to write the whole thing. Yes? Europorphinogen 3 synthase? I don't think it does. You mean Europorphinogen 3 is called porphyrinogen? I, I don't quite understand what you're asking. This thing has a different name or the enzyme has a different name? The what? The molecule. And what is the other name? No, porphyrinogens, there are lots of porphyrinogens, but we want this one, okay? This is our porphyrinogen, okay? So it doesn't have a different name, okay? All right. Yeah, so if the enzyme is not working, we'll get uroporphyrinogen one, but that is no longer useful for anything. It will get excreted in the urine. In No, deficiency of iron actually has no effect on this because we don't need iron yet. We'll need it in the very, very last step, but so far we don't need that. But since you already mentioned that, the whole name porphyrin comes from a disease which has been known from ancient times called porphyria. Okay. Porphyria. Uh, the Greek speakers here, what does it say? Yeah? Yeah, okay, so, <laughs> yes, porphyrios means dark red or purple or something like that, some very dark color, like wine colored or something like that, all right? And the reason why the name was called porphyria was that the people suffering from it, their urine would turn the, co the color of wine, okay? Dark red. Porphyrias, there are lots of them, and when you start preparing for your internal medicine exam or state exam, you will be thinking, oh my God, this is so horrible, there are so many porphyrias, and I don't understand that. Now, if you remember the synthesis of heme, it's gonna be simple, because all the porphyrias are caused by defects in different enzymes of heme synthesis. And they have different symptoms, okay? And different, uh, yeah, not causes, because all of them are, well, most of them are genetically uh, caused. But uh, there are lots of different porphyrias with lots of different uh, manifestations. However, since you already asked, if this enzyme is not working, we get uroporphyrinogen 1, which gets excreted. Now, all these porphyrinogens, porphyrinogens are not colored. Because remember, in order to have it colored, we need to have these double bonds here. And we don't have them there yet. They are just porphyrinogens. They're not porphyrins. So they are colorless. But once these colorless porphyrinogens are excreted in the urine and they are oxidized, with, they mix with air and they oxidize, they oxidize themselves spontaneously to porphyrins and this gives the dark red color to the urine. Yes, okay, so people with this kind of porphyria, I don't even remember which one that is, uh, but in, if there is a defect in uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase, they will have anemia, they will have less hemoglobin, okay? And they will also be excreting urine, which will be colorless, but when you, when you let it stand in air, it will slowly turn into dark, uh, turn into dark red. All right. Uh, 
there's lots that we could talk about porphyrias, and in fact, these aberrant porphyrins can also get into people's skin, and they cause photosensitivity. And this, there is a hypothesis, that this is behind the ideas or the pictures of vampires, because vampires were photosensitive, Okay, they couldn't show themselves in full sun. And indeed, patients with porphyria, with acute porphyrias, have the same problem. Okay, once they, once they are exposed to the sun, they can get blisters and it's very painful. Uh, and also, since they can't synthesize heme properly, the vampires had to suck blood in order to get the heme that they needed. Okay, now, I don't really believe that this is how vampires arose. Okay, I think it's more an abstract, you know, metaphor or something. But anyway, but it's a good story, and it, it sorry? Of course. Uh, I do believe that they existed in fairy tales and everywhere. Um, but it's a good story for you to remember the connection between porphyrins, photosensitivity, porphyrias, and heme. All right. Uh, let's keep moving. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. In the next step from uroporphyrinogen 3, what we do is we take all the A's, all the acetyls, which are not really acetyls, and decarboxylate them. So all four A's, acetyls, will get turned into M's, into methyls. Okay? We just take away all these carboxy groups and we get a molecule. looking like this. Like so. Which is called coproporphyrinogen. Usually coproporphyrinogen 3, okay, but Coproporphyrinogen. In the next step, we do another set of decarboxylations. Yes? Uh, it's called uroporphyrinogen 3 decarboxylase. Okay? decarboxylase, as you would expect, okay? It releases four molecules of CO2. Yep. All right, in the next step, you have a question? You can ask me, you can ask me. What's what? because they become decarboxylated. That's what uroporphyrinogen 3 decarboxylase does. It takes away the carboxyl groups from all the A's and turns them into methyls, okay? In the next step, we do another set of decarboxylations, but this, this time it's not just decarboxylations, it's also oxidation. And two of the P's get turned into V's which stands for vinyl. What, what is the structure of vinyl? Okay, so it's like ethyl. Okay, so normally you would think if we, if we decarboxylate this, we get ethyl. But in fact, we get a double bond here because there's an, an oxidation going on as well. Okay, so two of the P's get turned into V's. So now we have M, V, M, V, M, P, P, M, like so. The upside down one never changes? No, this one and the one next to it does not change. Okay, and the other two do get oxidized. The enzyme here is not called decarboxylase because it's more than decarboxylation, it's actually called oxidase. Okay, so it's called 
copro porphyrinogen 3 oxidase. Sometimes you can also find it as oxygenase, okay, because it uses oxygen, but either is fine. Oxidase. The resulting compound is called protoporphyrin. Sorry, protoporphyrinogen. Sorry, protoporphyrinogen. And you can find it in literature either as protoporphyrinogen 3 or protoporphyrinogen 9 for some strange reasons. Okay. But if you have protoporphyrinogen, it's good enough for me, I think. Protoporphyrinogen, hello? Protoporphyrinogen 3 or 9 is imported back into the mitochondrion. So we're back in the mitochondrion. Okay. And there, and we're really now at the end, we add the double bonds so that we connect the whole uh, conjugated system, yeah? As protoporphyrinogen. So after the decarboxylation goes back into the mitose. Okay? Uh, sorry, I made a mistake. It goes the step before. Okay, so the, the um, the other oxidation, decarboxylation, actually occurs already in the mitochondria. So let's put it here. Sorry, my mistake. It's the step before. Okay, so the first decarboxylation occurs in the cytoplasm, and the second decarboxylation oxidation occurs in the mitochondria. Okay? Protoporphyrinogen, we add the double bonds, and we make protoporphyrin. protoporphyrin, which is already colored. That's the first colored normal porphyrin. And in the last step, we add iron and we make it into heme. Okay? This enzyme is called protoporphyrinogen oxidase because it oxidizes it, right? Protoporphyrinogen oxidase. And the last one is called ferrochelatase. Sometimes you can also see it as heme synthase, but ferrochelatase, fer ferrochelatase is, is a more common name for it. Ferrochelatase. And that's heme. What about the enzyme for uh, protoporphyrinogen 2 It's called oxidase. Okay, because it oxidizes and makes these double bonds in these, these four double bonds. Okay, so it's an oxidase. All right. Now, the last bit, and there you will have to go into textbooks, is the degradation of heme. The degradation of heme is very simple. The ring is broken, is opened. The iron goes out, and we make biliverdin, and biliverdin is then converted in one step into bilirubin. And bilirubin is excreted into the bile as a bile pigment. So the degradation is pretty simple. I will just say that the first step, the breaking of the ring, is catalyzed by an enzyme called hemoxygenase. And it's the only reaction in our metabolism which produces carbon monoxide. Okay, so the opening of the heme ring produces carbon monoxide. So even if you are not a smoker and you don't live in an urban environment, you always have a certain level of carbon monoxide in your blood, which is being produced by degradation of heme. Okay, so we're continu continuously producing some carbon monoxide, which we breathe out, okay, continuously. And we can also measure this carbon monoxide to find out how much heme is degraded. Sorry? Of heme, heme oxygenase, the first step, the breaking of the, the opening of the ring. Oh, it can occur in any cells, okay? The majority, of course, occurs in the spleen because that's where the majority of heme is degraded. But, but most cells do contain heme oxygenase. Okay, so they can do it. All right, any quick questions at this point? Yes? Where is the coprophyrinogen oxidase found? Because I'm a bit confused. 
in the mitochondrion. So we move from the coproporphyrogen 3 is transported into the mitochondrion, and the second decarboxylation oxidation occurs there already. Okay, so it's a mitochondrial enzyme. Any pressing questions at this point? No? Um, learn the degradation of heme, it's important, but we'll also talk, and more, more so in the next year, we'll talk about jaundice as, as a symptom and what kind of different, what different kinds of jaundices there are. You may also talk about them in the seminar a little bit now, okay, but it's mostly gonna be uh, done in the next year. All right, okay, that's it. <laughs>